Uh, there are many places to start um, this story. Um, the one we decided to start is 1945, when Taiwan um, was just returned to China after a fairly long period of Japanese occupation. And I was wondering whether you could start us off by sort of painting a picture. How does Taiwan look like in 1945? How many people live there? How does the island do economically? What kind of culture is present? What language do people speak? So where do Taiwanese feel that they belong at this point of change in, 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 in the life of the island? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, 1945, as you can imagine, as you said, after 50 years of Japanese colonization, this is a rather long time. And of course, it is a time in which the Japanese try to transform gradually the Taiwanese into loyal subjects of the Japanese empire. So what kind of situation do we find when Taiwan is returned to Chiang Kai-shek's China, which was not the same China that had ceded it to, to Japan? This is also interesting. This was the Qing Empire. Well, we find a Taiwan that is, of course, in uh, comparison to many other places in East Asia, very modern. It, is, it was supposed to be a modern colony for Japan. And of course, Japan was exploiting, but at the same time, improving Taiwan while it ruled over it. So it created postal services, created banking system. It created a very modern education system for pupils. 70% of these people were literate in Japanese when Chiang Kai-shek took over, of course, uh, Taiwan. So you have a situation by which people, of course, felt inferior to the Japanese culturally and ethnically. Of course, they were different, although throughout the last 10 years of Japanese rule, they also tried to enforce uh, cultural measures that would make them feel as Japanese. They were never the same. You had differences in wages, for example, by which Japanese people actually made 60% more than a Taiwanese counterpart for the same job. So they felt inferior, but they also knew that, of course, Taiwan had become a modern country. It was the first capital, for example, to have electricity outside of Tokyo in East Asia. And it was hygienic conditions and, of course, education conditions that were very high, right? At the same time, you have, of course, the mainland, which is being, uh, of course, torn apart by a civil war between Mao and Chiang Kai-shek. And when Chiang Kai-shek fled over the island to the island of Taiwan with more or less one to two million people, the estimates are a bit uh, different. They, of course, came from a very different situation, right? They came from a China which was torn apart from famine and corruption, and they reproduced all of that on the island of Taiwan. So for the Taiwanese, which were, of course, almost 90% of them were ethnically Han Chinese, just like the nationalists who came over, it was very difficult to see this because on one side they thought we are being returned to China and we are all Chinese, right? But on the other hand, they, that kind of return actually started up a realization in the Taiwanese that they were different than the mainlanders. And this is the moment in time in which you also have this cleavage of identity being created, mm. right? And I think Taiwan is unique in this because often identity is given by ethnicity, and we will see later, of course, a variety of other things. But in this case, it is a unique situation because it is, I think it is the only place in the world in which ethnic identity and differences are given by arrival time on the island. So this is the moment in which people, also Chinese, who were already living on Taiwan, start considering themselves as different from the Chinese that come from the other provinces of China that came with Chiang Kai-shek within a period of two years, 47, 49. And this cleavage of identity became so important and so strong even in today's politics that after liberalization, as we shall see later, and democratization, you have parties competing, of course, to say something about national identity. And you had families being torn apart between those who felt that they were, of course, nationalists, they came after 45, and their offsprings that were born on ta in Taiwan, and those who had arrived during the 17th century. They were all Han Chinese, but they arrived at different times. Mm. So I think what you asked me to go back to your question was very difficult because at that time, Chiang Kai-shek, he didn't come immediately. He came in 49. Before that, of course, he sent people to rule over the, the province of Taiwan. And they tried, of course, to re the Taiwanese. They felt that the Taiwanese were 
disloyal. They had fought alongside the Japanese against Chinese people during the, for example, uh, massacre of Nanjing in 37. So they had to re-sinicize them. And this, of course, gave spark to a variety of protests in Taiwan, including a very big one, which is called the 228 incident, because it happened on February 28, 47. And this is, of course, what then prompted the nationalists to impose one of the longest standing martial uh, law rule in the whole world, 38 mm. years, 39 years. But, but so how did, the, how did the Taiwanese population feel about the return in 45 after all? Because as you said, mm -hmm. they were returning from being an occupied territory where they were treated as a second class citizens to the country that you know, they used to belong to before, which maybe you know, they were culturally closer, but which also, as you just pointed out, did not treat them as equals, treated them as disloyal, you know, subjects that needed to be re -sinicized. So what were the feelings and, you know, did they change in this process in this short period of 45 to 49 on the island towards being reunited, if you want, uh, with the mainland? Was there excitement at first? Was there trepidation? Both, I think. Uh, first, of course, as you said, they did not know what to expect. Mm -hmm. huh? On one side, they were, of course, as you say, trepidant because they knew they were going to be returned to their motherland, right? But on the other hand, when, of course, Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists came along to Taiwan, they realized quickly that situation was not going to go the way they expected it, right? For example, under the, the especially 20, last 20 years of Japanese rule, they had enjoyed local elections possibility, right? And they wanted to have the same kind of freedom that they had enjoyed during the Japanese colonial period, also under Chiang Kai-shek. When it became clear to the Taiwanese that this was not going to be possible, and then of course, you have to understand with the uh, 228 incident, uh, almost 10,000 people, there are different estimates, got killed. And many Taiwanese, especially the cultural elite, they fled abroad where they could actually uh, start a movement for the self-determination of Taiwan. So I would say that you have both feelings. People felt hesitant. They were somewhat happy. They didn't know what to expect. But there is a brilliant book by Peng Mingming, who was also a DPP politician who ran against, uh, in the first presidential election in 96, against uh, Li Denghui, he wrote a memoir of his father who served under the Japanese and he described it in a way that I think captures very well this uh, dilemma. He said that when the Chinese soldiers came on shore, the Japanese had lost Second World War and they were dressed smartly and what came from China were not smartly dressed soldiers, but they were coolies, you know, dragging their pants, badly dressed. And he said, my father had never felt so ashamed in his life because for him and for many other Taiwanese, this was the sudden realization that the culture of their ancestors, the Chinese culture, was in their mind becoming inferior to the culture of the colonizer, which had actually, of course, really mm. treated them badly, right? So this is really a, a, very, a very sad moment for yeah. Taiwanese, right? I, I do want to move on to sort of the... <clears throat> Um, the rule under, under KMT and Chiang Kai-shek after 49, but just because you mentioned it briefly, would you mind explaining 221, uh, 228 incident to, to everyone? 228 incident is an incident that basically happened on that day, uh, February 28, 47. So two years after Taiwan is given back to Japan and uh, people of course were unhappy because of this increasing uh, oppression by the Guomindang on the Taiwanese. And so you already have a situation which was very tense and then it took one peddler who was selling cigarettes who got reprimanded by the nationalist police and got killed. And this sparked a nationwide riot. They attacked police station and they killed a lot of uh, Guam, uh, Guomindang office, officials and mainlanders that had come with Chiang Kai-shek. And basically this is what prompted then uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists to impose in order to recapture and uh, reestablish order on the island to impose martial law. And this is actually a very uh, traumatic experience for many Taiwanese because they were not allowed to talk about this until martial law was lifted for almost 40 years. Nobody could actually talk about this. And this is also what relegated Taiwanese people who spoke a different language than the mainlanders. They didn't speak Mandarin. They mostly spoke Hokkien or Southern Minnan and Hakka, and they could not do so anymore they could only do so in private lives. They, most of them spoke Japanese as well. They could also not do that. So of course it relegated them. And this incident of course fortified this sentiment to second class citizens. Mm -hmm. Now, 
let's use this as a starting point, as he said, uh, 228 is February, February 28th was the starting point of martial law, which then was in effect for, for almost 40 years. And throughout this time when the KMT, the Kuomintang ruled under Chiang Kai-shek and then later under others, it, and as you, you point this out in, 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 um, in the slides you made um, that I read very nicely, it sort of propagates this myth of Taiwan as being part of a divided China and you know the, the, the Kuomintang basically biding its time on the island until it gets to recapture the mainland, which for in a certain uh, amount of time was a real possibility. But increasingly it became a myth that was propagated sort of essentially through propaganda. Why was it so important to the KMT to continue and uphold this myth? Why not use this chance to you know build a more distinct identity because at some point they must have realized that recapturing the mainland was just not, you know, in the cards anymore. So why was it so important for them to, to keep up this myth? Well, first of all, I think because one of the motivations as to why they imposed and then kept martial law for so long was that they kept telling the people we are in a state of war with China, right? So if that came off, then of course they would also have had to lift martial law and then of course in turn democratize much earlier the island of Taiwan. Democratization also came afterwards because of US pressure, right? So, and the myth, I think it came actually, the realization came quite late because as long as Chiang Kai-shek was alive, what he drilled into the population for a very long time, and he also imposed, probably we will see that later, cultural measures in order to sinify the people, to make them really believe that they were Chinese. So I think ideologically speaking, he was convinced for a very long time, and that's what he also told his soldiers, that they were going to go back to the mainland. I mean, these people had, um, had fled with Chiang Kai-shek, more, more or less between one and two million people estimates. Most of them were soldiers. Many of them actually left their families behind in mainland China. Many of them were trained to live in separate enclaves. They were not allowed to mingle with the Taiwanese population. And, you know, we always think of the mainlanders who came with Chiang Kai-shek as not just the victorious part I'm talking about in Taiwan, not, of course, with, with China, but in Taiwan, they were those who ruled. They were those who decided which way the country would go. But we don't have to forget that only the elite of the Guomindang actually had a part to play in politics. The majority of these soldiers were trained to think of themselves as not Taiwanese, as Shanghainese, as Hunanese, but they were not accepted by the local Taiwanese. They could not enter into the daily life because the Taiwanese wouldn't let them. So for example, you have a division in which uh, in small and medium businesses, only Taiwanese families actually had you know, power play and no Guomindang would ever be allowed in them, more or less. Of course, you have exceptions. So I think that it was a myth, but it was a myth that was believed by people mm -hmm. for a very long time. And not just the nationalists that were, of course, coming from China, especially those that were born in China and their offsprings, but also from the Taiwanese. Even if they don't agree or they did not agree with that myth, they were trained and they were not allowed to think otherwise. That was only possible later with the liberalization throughout, let's say, the 80s, before martial law was lifted, the last decade. But before that, it wasn't actually a myth. It was what they believed. And so talk to a little bit more about this process of, uh, as you refer to this, sinicization um, under the KMT. So there was this goal of, sort of to Chineseify mm -hmm. um, the population, I guess, also as a way in preparation of this recapturing of the mainland that everybody believed in. How did that work? So how does one kind of create a Chinese identity while not actually being on on the mainland that one aims to recapture later. You mentioned language, um, so Mandarin was sort of the, the language that everybody had to speak. What were other ways of sort of, sort of imposing or fostering a, a, a Chinese identity vis-a-vis -vis a Taiwanese identity during that time? Sure. Yes, of course. So the goal was to recapture the mainland, right? And in order to make people believe that that was the important thing to do, they needed to signify the people, especially because they were actually 70% literate in Japanese. So first of all, Japanese was forbidden. Guoyu was established as the national language. Guoyu is Mandarin speaking. They call it Guoyu in Taiwan and Putonghua in China. So the standard Mandarin Chinese was made to be the national language and cosmopolitan language was not Japanese anymore, but it became English. That's why so many... A very rich Guomindang family used to send their kids to the United States. Uh, they also used more cultural measures, which you have now uh, talked about, for example, signifying a space and time. So the calendar was made to start from 1912, 
and you still count like that. So now is the year 109 from the establishment of the ROC on the mainland in Taiwan. This is the year 109. Then they, of course, started to rename institution and streets, for example, after institutions, streets and people that came from the mainland, Tsinghua University, for instance. Uh, school children were indoctrinated in the thought of Sun Yat-sen, the father of the motherland, and of course, uh, uh, the founder of the Guomindang. And um, even very interesting is the fact that for a very long time, until later in the 90s, Li Denghui came along, when children went to school, all they learned in their textbooks was, of course, related to mainland China. So you have an absurd situation in both geographical as well as historical terms that because the Republic of China, Taiwan, still claims areas of the mainland that are not part of the mainland anymore. Some are part of Burma. One is, of course, now the independent Republic of Mongolia, which is still claimed by the ROC until, I think, the year 2006, very late. So you have absurd situation. And second, politically speaking, you had a lot of uh, parliamentarians that were part, for example, of the legislative UN, executive UN, they were elected in China and they froze elections. So there were no more elections possible. And these people represented, for example, the province of Xinjiang or the province of uh, Inner and then uh, Outer Mongolia, but there was no representative for the province of Taiwan. So people learn nothing about their own island, right? And for the people who had lived under the Japanese and who spoke Taiyu or Hakka, these are the main two Han groups you have, this was, of course, relegating them to a very humiliating condition. They could not know anything about themselves. They could not study anything about the culture. And this brought to a revival, of course, a cultural revival, as soon as it was made possible then later on in the 90s, to bring to the fore their own Taiwan and their own cultural uniqueness, which is probably going to be also a subject <laughs> that we're going to explore in the next probably. question. Um, so one thing that's interesting is that this myth that we've been discussing of uh, Taiwan you know, being the quote-unquote real or free China that will, would eventually recapture the mainland was also being, the myth was being a little bit propped up internationally as well, with mm -hmm. the U.S., for example, recognizing uh, Taiwan as the uh, free China. Mm -hmm. um, and that ended in 79. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there was a, a longer process, but eventually the U.S. did switch um, its diplomatic recognition over to the, the PRC. Um, and of course, subsequently, um, there, there was uh, the turn to democracy in Taiwan as well, and sort of this uh, development of a new Taiwanese identity, which we'll, which we'll get into. But talk a little bit about how important this, sort of, this international shift was. So all of a sudden, and I'm assuming that put a definitive end to this myth, was this de-recognition by Taiwan, one of Taiwan's most important, more important allies, the U.S., did that sort of, was that the starting point for Taiwan to sort of start thinking about its own identity differently? Because all of a sudden, sort of an outside recognition as, you know, this kind of real China in waiting was gone? I mean, the starting point for a real Taiwanese identity, I think, actually dates back to much earlier and much later. So it's a bit confusing, but the first time Taiwanese talked about uh, Republic of Taiwan and thought of themselves as a group different than other Chinese was actually when the Japanese came over to the island of Taiwan and they tried to establish a short-lived Republic of Taiwan, right? But then what you just said about the China myth coming to an end also because the United States, first the United Nations, of course in 71 expelled uh, the ROC and included the PRC. And then, of course, in 79, when the United States, which had been the biggest ally of Taiwan, also recognized the People's Republic of China rather than, of course, the ROC. Uh, this pushed, I would say, the fact that within Taiwan, people started to question, of course, the rule of the Guomindang and the fact that, you know, they had been uh, imposed martial law with the premises that you need to have orders that we can recapture the mainland. When that, of course, comes off, this is not the goal anymore because now the PRC is actually recognized, then the Guomindang needed to find new ways to legitimize its rule over the Taiwanese population. And it did that by seeking consent within the country, meaning this is a process they call of nativization. They started gradually to include more and more native Taiwanese, so not people that came after between, let's say, 47 and 49, but those who were already there, into the Guomindang. And of course, this process of nativization is what brought, of course, then 
um, the claims of the Taiwanese majority to the fore, both in cultural terms later mm. on and also in political terms later on with the first Taiwanese president being elected in 96, being actually a Taiwanese, but running for the Guomindang, Li Denghui. So you, you've already started talking a little bit about this new Taiwanese identity that is emerging. Um, I guess uh, starting a bit before uh, Li Denghui, but then, then with him as well. How does this Taiwanese identity look like? So what are pillars of it and how does it relate to the, the, the ethnic composition of the Taiwanese population, which you've touched upon, but I think might be worthwhile sort of going back to looking at who actually lives in Taiwan at this point and so where do they come from? There are mm -hmm. different yeah, sure. layers uh, to that population as well, of course. Yeah, so maybe just a, a small, a brief premise about the uh, composition, the ethnic composition of the island of Taiwan. So you have more or less between 75 and 80% of the people Han Chinese, but that came to the island of Taiwan in the 17th century from mainly two provinces, Guangdong and southern Fujian. These people are Hakka and Holo or Hoklo or Minnan Ren. This second group has three ways of calling them. So the big majority of the people are this Holo or Hoklo. They are almost 80 percent and they come from southern Fujian. So the majority of the people speak this language, Taiyu. Then you have a small percentage 10% of Hakka people, Kajaren, who came from Guangdong also during the 17th century. This is a time in which the Dutch ruled over Taiwan and needed cheap labor from China. That's why, that's why they went over. And then the rest of the people are the between 10 and 12% and of the mainlanders and their offsprings who came with Chiang Kai-shek between 47 and 49. And then you have a very small percentage of our Aboriginal people of Austronesian descent, they are 2% of the actual population, that were already in Taiwan much before, of course, the Han came over in the 17th century, right? So going back to your question about culture, um, for instance, a very interesting thing is a lot of very famous Taiwanese writers, uh, one uh, that actually came over from China, used to depict he wrote a book called Crystal Boys in English. Um, he actually depicted the life of China, of Beijing, of big cities there. And what changed when, of course, you had a renaissance of cultural, of course, and nativization of Taiwan is that they realized they were mostly an island that, were, that was composed of uh, farmers, fishermen. A lot of tradition they brought over from China were tied to the sea. Uh, the Mazu cult, for example. So they started focusing more on small life, small men in the countryside. This is in the cultural sphere, for instance. They started to be proud of speaking Taiwanese, which for a long time was not allowed, only in private lives. And it became so much popular that it became a defiant gesture later on with democratization. When you spoke Taiwanese at a rally, usually it was a DPP, a Democratic Progressive Party rally, directed against the Guomindang. So it became a defiant gesture. Now it is so cool that even Guomindang politicians try to actually speak a few words of Taiyu because it makes them feel cool. But actually, for a very long time, this was not even allowed, right? So uh, all these, so these are the people that we are talking about mm. that were for a long time relegated to second class, second tier people, and finally could express themselves culturally, but also politically. And sorry, maybe you want to mm -hmm. ask that question later, but you asked me about also what is the new Taiwanese identity, yeah, right? This Taiwanese identity, Xin Taiwan, the new Taiwanese person, was invented by none other than Li Denghui, who died a few weeks ago, right? He was the first democratically elected president of the country in 96, which brought China at the time to shoot missile towards Taiwan. Uh, in order to scare the Taiwanese into voting for him. He was actually a Guomindang politician who profited of this nativization movement because it included more Taiwanese. And at first, he of course paid lip service to what the Guomindang wanted him to say, meaning that he talked exactly like a Guomindang politician. He said that, you know, one day we will reunify with China. We are part of a divided China. But with time, he was actually expelled from the Guomindang and many people left the Guomindang because of him, because they considered him to be too pro-Taiwanese independence. So when he invented this new Taiwanese identity, actually he was trying to help a Guomindang fellow politician, which then became a president, mind you. And this new Taiwanese identity was meant to encompass all division, meaning we shouldn't look anymore at those who came first and those who came later, 
Shenlai Houdao in Chinese. But all of us are Taiwanese. We are now here and all of us, regardless of whether we arrived in the 17th century or in 45, 49, we are all Taiwanese. This is the new Taiwanese identity. It's more inclusive. It's more encompassing, right? Excellent. Then you mentioned a couple of times this process of uh, nativization is what you called it. It's sort of set in kind of as a counter uh, process almost to the sinicization under, under Chiang Kai-shek and, and KMT. So let's kind of skip ahead to present day or almost present day Taiwan. And if we look at this process of nativization, where are we? You know, is this something that you feel is still ongoing? So is the, is nativization continuing? Have we reached kind of like peak nativization in Taiwan? Is that still like, is it still useful to think in these terms, even when we talk about today's Taiwanese identity? Yeah, because we're skipping ahead in time, we can also talk about maybe the year 2000, so uh, not just nowadays yeah. time, but yes, it is still an ongoing process, but I would think it happens in a less offensive way because of the China threat on the other side of the strait. So in the year 2000, for the first time, because of also political internal reasons, opposition president was elected in Taiwan, and his name, of course, is Chen Shui-bian. Chen Shui-bian was very much a pro-Taiwanese independence advocate, and he was also not shy of provoking China, so at that time, you can call it uh, nativization. Many people call it desinifying Taiwan. He actually did very obvious or implemented very obvious things or measures in order to detach the country from its Chinese heritage. So he started, for example, renaming institution. The avenue outside the presidential palace was given an Aboriginal name, Ketalaga Avenue, right? And this was an Aboriginal tribe that had lived there centuries before. And all these kind of things, he started focusing on the history, on the geography of the island of Taiwan. And for the first time, he included Aboriginal people because he thought that Aboriginal people are what make Taiwan different than China. China often claims that Taiwan is mm, ethnically Chinese and therefore it is part of the Chinese nation. He wanted to uh, reconstruct and deconstruct this frame and say we are different also because we have a different ethnic composition we have Aboriginal people so Aboriginal people were instrumentalized at this time during Chen Shui Bian's time so I would say that now to go back to your question you actually do have this process going on but in a very more subtle way mm -hmm. I mean Tsai and Wen is never provocative now I think this, the Damocles Schwert is in the hands of the Chinese because they are the ones who refuse to engage in talks with her because she won an knowledge 92 consensus. Maybe we can talk about this more during the Q&A. But before that, you had this process of nativization or de Taiwan, which was very much conducted in a way that was uh, somewhat arrogant, I would have to say, and chauvinistic, anti-Chinese chauvinism was going on at the time when Chen shui was ruling. And now it is more subtle, but now you have the problem, or however you want to face it, for the Chinese it is a problem, for the Taiwanese less so, that you have younger generations of Taiwanese voters coming to the fore and they have less and less ties with mainland China. So you have this process of uh, nativization even stronger in a way than before because Taiwan has now undergone a democratization phase, right? And many people, and I think this will be interesting for when we talk about what is our identity, do we actually ground our identity in antiquity, in ancestry, in common ancestry, or do we also understand it as a shared social political experience? Because I think this is what many Taiwanese nowadays feel. They have undergone very different social political experiences, including democratizing Taiwan, than what happened in mainland mm. China, than what has happened to the Chinese in mainland China. Thus, they feel different. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about the, the ties to the mainland uh, on, on, on the cultural level. So because one thing that's also happened over the last years, decades, is that, of course, the economic integration between Taiwan and the mainland has strongly deepened. There's a lot of uh, connection. There's a lot of tour mainland tourism to Taiwan, or at least there used to be. There were dozens of daily flights, or at least there used to be b b before the pandemic. So this integration seems to have deepened and deepened. Um, I was struck a few years ago when I was speaking to um, American, uh, American journalists in Beijing and working for a large American organization, and they said, so apparently that before you are posted as a correspondent for this organization to mainland China, they will send you to Taiwan. And part of this was to learn the language. Taiwan has a good reputation to, for, for, for language learning, of course. But it was also, I understood a little bit in sort of the idea of 
acclimatization. So sort of you kind of you kind of you're in, in, in a gateway to mainland China in a way of sort of on, on, on a cultural level. So there are undeniably there are these these connections, right? Taiwan is not culturally separate from, from mainland China and, and probably never will be. How do these sort of connections and influences play into this ongoing development of sort of a distinct Taiwanese identity? Well, as you said, I mean, of course, the pull towards economic integration, which started especially in, in the 80s after China, of course, uh, also launched the reform to, do, to, to um, modernize the country, right? This pull towards economic integration, of course, usually brings about the fact that people will be quieter on the sphere of wanting to become independent, right, from China, because the link is there. And of course, many people, by the way, this is something we observe also in Switzerland and in many other countries, feel, of course, the wrath of China if they, of course, would go against the narrative of China regarding Taiwan, right? And then the reprimand, of course, in the uh, economic sphere. So you have these two pulls and push, right, towards, uh, let's say that mostly economic voters, they are called, are actually those that would actually opt simplifying everything for an integration and unification with China. Whereas identity voters, also simply put, are those who would, of course, forsake everything for the sake of having an independent Taiwan. Um, of course, the situation is not that black and white, right? During Ma Joe's time, you have had a president that launched uh, a rapprochement between the two. For the first time, as you mentioned, he, of course, instituted direct flights. He created several economic treaties for which, of course, Taiwan and China would be more bound to each other, economically speaking. And Taiwan arguably has profited, of course, from the mainland China. It is also the only country that after the incident in Tiananmen continue investing as if nothing had happened in China, whereas other Western countries pulled back for a while, right? So these links are there and Taiwan, of course, is preoccupied exactly. That's the whole debate, right? Whether you can have influence also from mainland China in Taiwan's elections because the so-called Taishang, the business people, that invest in China from Taiwan are arguably linked and they are a very strong constituency in Taiwanese politics, right? The blue constituencies. But I would also argue that things change gradually because precisely what my NGO did scared many Taiwanese. Uh, after a period of frozen conflict, suddenly you have a president that actually uh, basically ties you to mainland China from a variety, of course, of, of uh, let's say in the economic sphere, but also in the more cultural sphere. They had meetings between the Guomindang and the, and the Chinese Communist Party. Many people got, of course, uh, fearful that these kind of links and uh, the ties to China were proceeding too fast. So a combination of identity politics and fear of the PRC also brought in 2016 people to elect Tsai Ing-wen, right? Mm -hmm. And then later on, of course, you have another problem, the fact that Tsai Ing-wen was not faring very well before the elections for a variety of reasons. But when the Hong Kong protests came about, many people in Taiwan identified and they thought if they can break their own rules, the part, of course they had a, giant, a joint Sino, uh, British declaration agreement, maybe this could also happen to us. And this has reinforced Taiwanese identity within Taiwan. So to go back to the initial question, you, you see a shift after 2012. This is the time in which mind you got elected for the second term. You have the percentage, traditionally you have three, three categories of people, right? People who feel exclusively Chinese in Taiwan. You can imagine these are people that mostly came over with Chiang Kai-shek and their offsprings, right? They are gradually dying out and their ties are also gradually dying out. So after 2012, you have more or less two, 3% of people who felt only Chinese. And then you had more or less, and here of course the, the percentages are never really that clear, but more or less, let's say 54% of people who felt both Taiwanese and Chinese. And then of course, more or less, what is it? 40 something percent of people who felt only Taiwanese. If you look at it from the, situation nowadays, and also if you look at it in different age cohorts, for example, under 20, people who feel exclusively Taiwanese are over 80%. Mm. So I would say that, you know, it might be less obvious, but Taiwanese identity is definitely growing. And it is not what you mentioned before, the cultural and ethnic ties are there. People go to Taiwan to learn about China. Yes, maybe it was more obvious at a certain moment in time and less today. But of course, Taiwan has a variety of traditions, rituals that came from mainland China and that are still alive in Taiwan. 
even much better because of course you had the cultural revolution and other upheavals in China which destroyed these kind of rituals. Mm. So it would make sense that traditionally you go to Taiwan to learn about China. And of course they speak the same language, they speak Mandarin, right? But I would also say that this is gradually changing because and this here, I also call the international situation into, into, into the conversation. Uh, China, especially under uh, a DPP dominated Taiwan is gradually eroding the space for Taiwan to be called Republic of China. So they won't allow Taiwan to participate uh, as a gesture of goodwill to the WHO assembly as they did before when Ma Ying-jeou was ruling. And they won't allow it to be part, of course, of the civil aviation, all these things that are connected to the United Nations, right? And this is gradually eroding a sense uh, and a tie between Taiwanese people of being actually the Republic of China so that they identify more and more only to Taiwan. Mm. And this brings, of course, this makes Taiwanese identity rise. Look at the story that came out, I think today in the answer set of the passport, right? Now you have Taiwan written very big. Republic of China in English is almost not non-visible and in Chinese you still have it. But of course, this is also a prog If you want, it is a choosing side yeah. argument in my opinion. Yeah. Before we um, move on to the q and I want to end with trying to look at least a little bit into the future. And the question that I thought about is, Taiwan is such an interesting example, and you, know, you did such a fantastic job today of, sort of explaining to us in, in how many ways it's, it's complicated and unique. But still, I wondered, is there a place in the world, or has there ever been one historically that is similar to Taiwan when it comes to sort of, you know, being culturally uh, very strongly and in complex ways influences of a, a, a much larger and, and eventually also much more powerful neighbor, you know, and could we look to this example to maybe also draw lessons for what's in store uh, for Taiwan? Of course, we all know sort of the, the apocalyptic Taiwan scenario in the future, and we can talk about it in the Q&A, but I was wondering, you know, so is there, can we, can we do a comparative study with, from Taiwan to something else that will tell us something new? Yeah, I'm laughing at this because the first time we talked about it and I read the question, my actually feeling was to think about the Swiss German part of Switzerland <laughs> and Germany, right? I mean, which you also have a lot of influences, the same with Ticino and Italy, maybe. But to go back to your question, I would say that Taiwan's situation, I mean, you have a lot of places in the world in which a much larger and economically and politically important neighbor can influence a country. As I said, Germany with Switzerland, Italy maybe with Ticino, but I think Taiwan's situation is unique, first of all, because here we are talking about a not officially recognized country, right? Mm. I mean, Taiwan is de facto a country, but not the Jure. So the kind of maneuvering space that Taiwan has is very limited. And if you want to compare, I think you would have to compare with similar situations in the world. So I would go about it by thinking what kind of countries were divided. If this is the narrative mostly from the PRC, right? A divided China and from the Guomindang, right? They were arch nemesis, but they agreed on this one thing. And now, of course, Taiwanese opposition movement, they don't agree on that anymore. So if you look at it from the perspective of a divided nation category, right? You had four others, the two Germanys unified in the 1990, uh, two Vietnams, 75, Korea, the two Korea still divided, and of course the two China still divided. But even here you have differences because in all of these other examples, these two entities, even if they did not agree with each other, especially in, uh, let's say, mm -hmm. ideological terms, because often they were, of course, uh, springing out of the Cold War uh, to block system division, they still recognized each other as equal partners, right? This is not the case in Taiwan anymore because, of course, at the beginning, actually, the threat was mutual. The PRC also feared, of course, that Chiang Kai-shek might recapture the mainland. But that, as you said, at least 15, 20 years later was not the case anymore. And now nobody would ever believe that if they ever were to be reunified, it would be the ROC Taiwan ruling over the PRC, right? So China does not recognize and treat Taiwan as its equal. Taiwan, of course, is seen from the perspective of the PRC as a renegade rebel province that needs to be reconducted under its rule of course, with agreement, right? And interestingly enough, uh, a couple of days ago, they also dropped, or actually a bit more in the National Congress, they also dropped for the first time, the PRC and the Communist Party, the word peaceful means, 
they drop that word peaceful. So uh, recapture the mainland, going back to the apocalyptic scenario at all costs. So if you want to compare, I think it is very difficult and probably you can't find any other case in history similar to that of Taiwan because of these uh, factors. The fact, of course, that if you look at it from the perspective of the divided nation syndrome, they are, there is a, an asymmetry of power mm. in which one entity does not consider the other as its par to you know, be talked about.